Okay. Okay, hello and welcome to the September 13th meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. The time is 7.06. Um, all members are present except Laura. Um, we're gonna start, I don't see any attendees yet, so I'll wait on my announcements, but, um, oh, one, okay. Well, just quickly, if you're here for either 46 Faring or the UMass SWCA lot 13th, both of those hearings will be continued to September 27th. So that's both um, Bering Street and the UMass Lot 13 will be continued and we're not hearing them tonight. Okay, so I have no other announcements. Uh, Dave's not here. So I think we can, oh, I just saw Dave pop in. So I'm gonna bring him in. Oh, weird. Dave, he came can... in as an attendee. Yeah, I just I just put it popped him in, but um <laughs> Dave, we I'm can getting see a... your name. Yeah. I'm getting a oh, oh yeah, oh, we can hear you. Cool. I got an error code that says failed to change role to panelist. That's so weird. Okay. But I can you hear me or no? We can. Yes. We just can't see you, but you you came in right in time for the director's report, Dave. So, <laughs> please uh, well, continue on. I don't know. I'm in my my office in my basement, and sometimes it's a little funky here. So maybe um maybe all I'll have is audio. But um yeah, I'll be fairly quick. Happy to take any questions. Don't have too many updates tonight. Um, a couple of things just to uh, fill you in on. Um, so Puffer's Pond testing is completed for the year. We typically test the pond uh, weekly from Memorial Day to Labor Day. I went one week beyond just because the weather was so nice. And frankly, I just wanted to see if the pond cleared up, the, the E. coli levels cleared up. And in fact, they really didn't clear up that much. So we're kind of, we're, we're, we're at the end of our testing season. Um, um, I think... I was thinking about this uh, buffers earlier today, and and my conclusion was that this was probably the most challenging year uh, we've had with water quality at Buffers Pond. Um, this is a rel relatively new phenomenon. It's really in the last four to five years that water quality at Puffers has really gone downhill. When I first started with the town, uh, we actually never closed the pond. We never we never had problems with E. coli. So um, here we are in 2023. I think um, over the winter, what I'd like to do is kind of put together a small um, kind of working group, uh, pull in some folks from the university and perhaps Amherst College and maybe a commission member um, and really take a look at Puffer's Pond and say, you know, where are we? Uh, kind of the state of the pond in terms of water quality and really look at, um, you know, a, a more robust testing um, 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 routine and and trying to look for the sources. Can you hear me okay still? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's been a frustrating year. I know for the public, a lot of disappointed people, some folks who just swim in the pond anyway, but uh, from a from a town standpoint, from a safety standpoint, from a public health standpoint, um, that's not really where we want to be. And so we need to look at upstream, potential upstream sources, we need to look at the sediments in the pond. We need to look at ducks and geese, dogs, uh, possible other sources upstream, which might include um, um, underperforming um, or non-performing uh, septic systems. So uh, uh, happy to have any of your input tonight or in future meetings or by email or phone as we kind of take a, a harder look at puffers. Um, any questions on that or or um, comments that anyone wants to share with me before I go on? Yeah, Dave, can you yeah. tell us how how many times or how long the pond was closed for this year? Uh, off the top of my head, I'm I'm not in my office, but I I um I, I'd have to get that for you, Jason. But um, I would say the ponds. Uh, failed, failed uh, water quality testing probably seventy percent of the summer. Um, you know, testing from May to last week, 
Um, it, it's been a really difficult year. It's really only passed probably three or four times, three or four weeks. And those weeks, you know, we, typically what happens is uh, if we get a period of dry weather without the flashy storms we've been having, um, you know, things kind of settle down there and, and we get a couple of weeks of, of uh, acceptable um, uh, testing. But this year with all the, the rains we've had, um, it's really been, as I've said, quite disappointing and frustrating for the public. So, but happy to, um, you know, I, uh, I know Jason, you you have some experience in, you know, obviously your, your professional background, but happy to talk with folks offline about how we kind of pull together a group. We've had UMass uh, work with us in Amherst College in the past on some water quality testing up there, a more robust approach. We did do some upstream water quality testing some years ago, and we can pull out that data. It was pretty unremarkable, um, but we do have some septic systems upstream. Um, I think it's gonna be kind of a comprehensive approach. So, okay to move on, Michelle. Yes, thanks, Dave. Um, we are continuing to do interviews for our assistant land manager position. This position has been uh, vacant all summer long. I'm hoping to really wrap this up in the next two weeks. Uh, we have been very short staffed this summer and the trails, I think, uh, show that. They're quite overgrown. Um, so uh, I hope to have some announcement at your next meeting that we have hired uh, a new assistant land manager. That's a full-time job. We have full two full-time positions in conservation in the field. Um, that's Brad Borderweek, the land manager, and then this vacant assistant land manager position. Um, trail work as best we can continues. We do have a couple of summer staff, uh, field staff that have been working part time uh, with Brad, uh, trying to keep trying to keep up with trails and uh, uh, trash at Puffer's Pond and things of that nature. And uh, so we really haven't embarked on any major trail um, um, renovation projects this summer because we've been down so so much in staff. Um, Aaron and I are looking at a couple of projects in the next couple of months. One is she is nearing completion on a notice of intent for the uh, accessible trail at Hickory Ridge. This is the um, the trail that will loop around the southern portion, the southwestern portion of Hickory Ridge. Um, many of you may recall me announcing, and it was in the newspaper and, and other media sources about us getting uh, what's called a park grant for this project. We combined the park grant with um, CPAC money, Community Preservation Act money, and we have, uh, I think, over $400,000 to complete an accessible trail at Hickory Ridge. So we're hoping to get that notice of intent to you at the next meeting. Um, It'll have to go through uh, also some review by the planning board and um, we will likely take it to the design review board and also the um, disability access advisory committee. And so we hope to get it bid out to bid this fall, but it'll certainly be a spring construction at this point. I don't think we'll make it uh, the, you know, by the time the snow hopefully falls. So that's a pretty exciting project and kind of the first in uh, what we hope will be many down at uh, Hickory Ridge, uh, the former golf course. The other project we're working on is with the Kestrel Trust over at the Sweet Alice Conservation Area. Uh, this is the project we teamed up with Kestrel on to um, site their office, their permanent office, and we purchased uh, land from the Epstein um, family, and we created that loop trail around the, uh, the pond there. Unfortunately, the beavers got got wind of our, our wonderful vision and decided to flood a good portion of the trail. And the loop uh, is no longer a loop. It's kind of, um, well, they're kind of two dead end trails. You can connect to the Mount Holyoke Range trails and DCR, but um, we'd love to re, re, uh, reconnect that loop trail. So um, we will um, bring that, I think, to you next meeting. Is that right, Aaron? Yes, uh, we're going to bring that as an amendment to a, a, a previous notice of intent for trail work there, and we'll have details on that for you at the next meeting. Um, we're, we're we're collaborating with Kestrel. We're going to try to do a raised boardwalk uh, using a, a very minimally impactful um, construction approach using 
not exactly helical piers, but something very similar, um, you know, uh, posts, uh, metal posts driven into the ground, and then a boardwalk, a uh, simple boardwalk built on top of that. And uh, we're looking at probably over 100 feet. Is that right, Aaron? I think it was 100, 125 feet long, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I asked for the length, so they're they're getting some final details to me. So I'm not entirely sure the what the length will be. But this is on the southern end of the pond where we put in a very simple bridge a year, year and a half ago. And and the beavers um, took notice of that and said, well, that's wonderful. We'd like to flood that bridge and that trail. So uh, off they went, nature's engineers, and they did it. And so uh, we'd love to create, um, and it'll be a really nice boardwalk and, and take people um, in a fairly low impact way over over that shallow uh, part of the beaver pond that's been created. So that's a project we're working on um, with Kestrel. And they're gonna, they, they've committed to providing um, both the materials for that project as well as the labor. So um, it, it, another example of great collaboration with Kestrel. So those are the quick updates I have. Um, if anybody has any questions or, um, you know, we'll be doing some field mowing this fall, keeping trails open, Mount Pollux, um, as best we can uh, with limited staff. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, okay, unless anyone has any more comments, um, move on to land management updates. And we have one land use application from Amherst College. I don't see any representatives here, but uh, this is a recurring a long recurring um, class activity with not exactly water quality, but um, water, I don't know, characteristic it, monitoring. Yeah, it's a, uh, they, they look, I think, at uh, a lot of macro invertebrates to see what they can. Um... Do they? I didn't see any of that in the reports that they posted, but if they're not reporting yeah. that, I'd love to hear that. Well, so they've done that previously. I'm not, I think they're moving more towards water quality sampling now um, because I think the town has encouraged them to move in that direction. But previously they've done some of the macroinvertebrate sampling. And I think that the information on our website, there are some reports from previous work that they've done. So um, you might see kind of shifts in um, yeah, okay. some of the tasks that they've performed. But yeah, so this time around, they're doing uh, water quality sampling. And they've done this previously um, at several locations in town. I think they're doing like, um, what is it like, uh, like sediment um, and, and temperature, but not necessarily like E. coli. So it is not necessarily informative of upstream water quality in terms of Puffer's Pond. But um, anyway, just it's a student group. They go out and they do measurements on the water. So I don't know if everybody had a chance to look at the application. Suspended sediment. That's what I was thinking of. Anyone have any comments on that one? No. Okay. Well, looking for a motion to approve the land use permit. I move to approve the land use permit. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, on, okay, Bruce on the first, Jason on the second. I'll second, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Um, okay, Bruce on the first, Jason on the second, Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? I, I saw hand motions. Aye. Yep, thanks. Alex? Alex might have left us momentarily. Hi. Thank you. And I'm an I. No, I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Probably yeah. a slight I delay, I'm guessing. Yeah. Then. We got you. I'll just note the delay next time. Okay. Um, we have 10 minutes before the next meeting. Do you want to knock off some other business? Absolutely. Okay. Um so uh, we have two requests for certificates of compliance. These are very old orders of conditions dating back to the um, mid 80s. Uh, one is for 15 Wildflower Drive. One is for 40 Hop Brook. I took a walk out there this morning to have a look at the sites. Um, both of the sites are stable. I did um, 
upload photos to your um, uh, packets kind of late in the in the day today with the, the photos from that site visit. Um, I can try to pull them up so that we can share them. Um, if my if my computer will allow. Sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. So we'll give it a shot. These are the photos from Wildflower. And just bear with me while I navigate to um, Forty Hot Brook. <laughs> That's my vehicle <laughs> mileage <laughs> when I started my site business. Uh, okay, there we go. Yeah, so I mean, both of the sites were were stable. Um, I didn't have any issues with the um, issuing a complete certificate of compliance on both of them. And I can pull up the screen to make this a little easier for people. Bear with me. Okay. Bruce, I see your hand. Yeah. Your question, comment. Yes. <clears throat> Given their age, are both of these coming to us now because both of them are being sold? Yes. Yeah. And that's generally when we see um, houses in these large subdivisions and they sort of get um, so uh, just for an example, like let's say somebody comes in with like a 40 house subdivision, the order of conditions will get recorded on the whole subdivision. And so anytime one of those homes are sold, they'll come to us looking for a certificate of compliance. So we'll see a, a lot of these for um, like the houses in Amherst Woods are a great example. Okay, any other questions, commissioners? Nope, okay. Booking for motions. I move to oh, issue I have one. I have one statement. Sorry, just this is a very minor thing. I noticed question six for a, um, a Wildflower Drive wasn't completed. Yes or no? No, oh, thanks, Jason. Good catch. I'm sorry, that, what was it? Question number six on the Wildflower Drive application wasn't answered. It appears that it just needs to be checked off. Question six. On the copy of... Okay, I'm looking at the wrong one. Bear with me. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, my computer moves a little slow when I'm remoted into the machine. Okay. Yeah, any old orders like that that we that we um they didn't start requiring engineer stamps, believe it or not, on plan sets until I want to say like 2010-ish um, is when DEP started incorporating that. So a lot of the old permits won't have, a lot of the old orders won't have um, uh, the engineer stamp on them. And that might be why they're confused because if they don't have the original plan or there was no stamp on the original plan, they might not have the information to answer that accurately. Do we need that checked off, yes or no, before we make a motion? Um, I, I would consider that to be sort of an administrative issue. I, I wouldn't be very concerned with it. Um, if it was a more recent order that was issued like after 2010, then you'll notice then that we'll have an as-built plan um, that's associated or and or a statement from a, a signed stamped statement from an engineer that certifies that the project was built in compliance with the original order of conditions. Most of the um certificates of compliance before that time don't have a condition requiring that so in in most of those cases that's um sort of not applicable 
but thank you for noticing that. And that that type of detail is very much appreciated when folks catch that. Okay, well, if everybody is comfortable with moving forward with that, then maybe you could bring our motions back up on the screen. Oh yeah, I'm sorry about that. I got it here. I move to issue a complete certificate of compliance for 15 water wildflower drive and 40 hot brook drive. I will second that motion. Okay, we have Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Andre? Aye. J Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. Awesome. All right, we got four minutes. Can we do emergency yeah. cert? Okay. Yes. Um, so we received a request for emergency certification um, from DCR. Um, and this was an after the fact emergency certification. It was a situation where um, the there was a couple sinkholes that formed on the side of the bike path. Um, and they, um, to, to address the safety issue of that, basically um, stabilized it with some riprap stone. Um, I did condition that they communicate with Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program because um, as far as where the, the work locations um, landed on the bike path relative to the NHESP estimated habitat polygon, I wasn't entirely sure if they were within, um, so they had to sort of check their coordinates with um, uh, natural heritage, but you can see this is an example of the stabilization that they did to complete to um, repair the sinkhole that was forming or the washouts that were forming. Um, I think there was a couple locations where they did this work um, and they provided the um, the coordinates for me so I could include those as an attachment to the certificate of compliance. But the work the work was done before I even knew about it and I wanted to issue this emergency certification just to sort of make it legal um, and let I let them know that in the future if anything like this happens they should absolutely coordinate with the town before undertaking any repairs. Thanks Aaron. Bruce, question? Um, this may not be within our purview but that bike path has been closed for, I, I go by that intersection fairly often and it's been closed for many, many months. Yeah, so yeah. this is actually the segment of the bike path that's north of Station Road. Um, the, you're right, the section that's south of Station Road has been closed because they're, they've been in the process of resurfacing it. Um, and they're, and actually, as long as we're talking about it, they're sort of in the final phases. And I believe um, mid-September, they're going to be doing the final, um, uh, um, what is, I'm drawing a blank on the word, but when they spray the area with seed, um, they're going to be sp spraying that down so that um, we can establish okay, grass seed. Hydro seed. Hydro seed. Hydro seed. Thank you. <laughs> That's the term I was looking for. They're going to hydro seed uh, mid September. So that project will hopefully be wrapping up, um, you know, before winter or, um, okay. arrives. Okay. So we need a motion to approve the emergency certification? Uh, yes, to, uh, to ratify it. Ratify. Yes. Yep. All right, I move to ratify the emergency certification issued to MADCR for safety repairs slash sinkholes on the bike path off Station Road. Second. We have Jason was on that the first. Alex? Sorry. Yeah, that was Alex on the second, Jason on the first. Um, Andre? Abstain, I work for DCR. Okay, Bruce? Uh, yes, I. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. And I just have one sort of follow-up question. When you say that you've communicated them to them to, that they should be notifying us for this, like the emergency work or whatever, who is your point of contact? And is there like a second point of contact or like how, how solid is that line of communication to them 
Yeah, to, that's to a great them. question, Michelle, and very timely. So yeah. ordinarily, I'd be communicating with Paul Jenegy, who's the um, sort of the director of trails. I'm not sure his exact title um, for DCR, but he actually just announced this week that he's transitioning to a new position. Um, and so somebody's going to be filling his shoes. So I'm going to have to be communicating with whomever the new person is. Um, and yeah, well, I'm wondering if a sort of memo to establish that line of communication is is reasonable since there's enough of that bike trail that, you know, it comes up quite a bit for us seasonally. So maybe that's something we could consider just so that it's on file. We can refer back to it. You mean um, a memo that basically states what our expectations are as far as communication on maintenance? Yeah. And then when we know about staff turnover, we can just forward them that sort of established line of communications memo. Yeah, I think it's something worth considering. Um, yeah, I can I can find out more from Paul um, who the interim is going to be when he steps down and how to kind of keep those lines of communication open so that we can um, initiate some kind of communication like that once they get a new yeah. person on board or even in the right. interim. Just because often the bike trail abuts, you know, NH ESP habitats and oh yeah all, all sorts of wetlands. <laughs> so yes, it, it does. Yeah, it, it comes to us fairly often. Okay, thanks for thinking about that. Okay, so um, let's move on to the notice of intent for Goddard Consulting LLC for 52 Faring Street LLC for the construction of a single family house and garage and associated site work and preparation for the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at 50. 46 Faring Street, map 11C, lot 123. Um, and if there's any public here, we don't have a quorum. Um, the background for that is that we've had some changeover in the composition of our uh, commission recently. So there are only four members that are uh, available to vote on this, one of them, and we need all four present to vote and hear this and one of them is absent tonight so we will be continuing this and with that i'm looking for a motion to continue i move to continue the public hearing for 46 fairing street notice of intent to september 27 2023 at 7 40 p.m a second we have Andre on the first, Bruce on the second. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. You guys are being very efficient tonight. Yes, making up for last time. Okay. Um, all right, next we have SWCA on behalf of UMass for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures in the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at lot 13 Olympia Drive at 8D, lots 15, 16, and 3. Um, in this case, the applicant has requested a continuation to the September 27th meeting. And um, so you're all here last time, so there are a lot of pending pieces of information that we are expecting to see, which we have not, unfortunately, um, but hopefully that will be presented on September 27th. So unless there's any big questions on this, I'm looking for another motion. So Michelle, I'm just going to interrupt for just a moment. So um, because the hearing is scheduled to open at 735, and I know this is nitpicky, oh, we... but it's 734. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we got to wait another 60 seconds. I should have read Maybe. slower. All right. <laughs> I know. I was going to tell you, you've been being very efficient here. <laughs> uh, is there anything great. else we can say about that? Well, me and Aaron had talked about maybe having another site visit. Um and, you know, I don't want to talk too much about this with, without the applicants, but I think I didn't get a chance to go out and do this. So maybe Aaron, I don't know if you've already asked the applicant, but maybe if this continues and continues, we can possibly have another site visit and perhaps other staff or other commissioners, if you're interested in that, communicate with Aaron just to see if we have some kind of um, uh, scheduling that would work or enough interest that it makes sense. Or maybe we could just stop by and see it because I think it's accessible sort of just by a drive-by. All right. Is it it is 7.35. <laughs> and with that. Uh, can I 
Can I, Michelle? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think it, it requires, having been there with Alex and tromped around twice, mm -hmm. it really does require having somebody to go around and show you the different parts. Okay. Um, and driving, it, it's sort of hidden. If you drive by, you don't really understand it. All so, right, good to know. That's good to know. So then maybe, Aaron, we could talk more about um, scheduling a second site visit. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Bruce. Yeah. Boots and long pants or, and long sleeves are advisable. There you really? go. Uh, <laughs> Quite yeah, maybe? It's, no, it's thorns and mm, okay. dense brush and mosquitoes and God knows what all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for the tips. All right. Good to know. <laughs> okay. Well, looking for a motion. I move that we continue the public hearing for lot 13 of Plumbia Drive notice of intent to 92723 at 745 p.m. I'll second that motion. Okay, Alex on the motion, Jason on the second, Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an I. I should have had Alex read. He's in slow motion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, well, we're um, making excellent time tonight, and I'm glad that we have a couple other business items that we can knock off the list before our next meeting, because our next meeting is a little more um, hearing intensive, as will the next upcoming meetings. Um, so would you mind if I go into some of the other business items, Michelle? Please do, thanks. Okay. Okay, so we're going to be running into a lot of permit expirations, um, a lot of permits that were issued right around the time, well, right before I started are coming to expiration date. So a lot of permits that I was present on the kickoff for are kind of ending their life cycle if folks didn't request for um, an extension. Um, the first item under the informal inquiries is 200 Leverett Road. This was a construction of a single family um, house on Leverett Road. Um, it's been a difficult one because the work was permitted and began right at the start of COVID. Um, and it was actually permitted um, after the governor's um, tolling period um, requirement. So I think it was, I can't think of the exact date, but this permit was issued after that date. So it's not subject to the automatic tolling period extension. Um, and I contacted them back in April and I said, hey guys, you guys really need to do your final stabilization out here. Your permit is nearing expiration. And they, they said, oh yeah, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. And then it expired in August. So here is the problem. Um, the site is open, has not been stabilized, and there's a large stockpile on the site. And what needs to occur is that they need to spread the topsoil and seed the site down and basically initiate final stabilization before winter. Um, they said that they're prepared to do this, um, but they don't currently have an active permit. And so I told them, you know, there's two options. Either you file a new permit to do your final stabilization or we bring it to the Conservation Commission and see what they say. Um, just from where I sit, it would be advantageous to the resource areas that are down gradient of this site to do the final stabilization before winter. Um, I realized that it was the applicant's sort of negligence that resulted in the permit expiring, but um, having a new permit filing simply to spread the topsoil and seed it down, I think would be the time um, that it would take to require them to do that. And by the time they got their permit in hand, I think we would be past the growing season at this point or pretty close to it. Um, so my recommendation would be that the commission allows the, well, number one, we do another erosion control inspection prior to them doing the, the finished grade, just to make sure that the erosion control is is still in functioning condition prior to them doing the work. 
and then um, number two, that they commit to finishing the work within a 48 hour period. So basically that they get out there, they spread the, the loam and seed and finish mulch job um, within a 48 hour period. And basically at that point, um, they would have to wait until the seed germinates and then get a final inspection from me to uh, remove the erosion controls. But I think that would basically close out the project and close out the permit so that um, the site was stable before winter. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Andre? Um, just curious what the, uh, I suppose, legal me mechanism is for this or what, what's the mechanism uh, to, to get this done? Um, well, it's completely at your discretion whether you allow it or not. And it would be basically a, you know, a written we would provide them with a formal written response that states what the conditions would be. Um, I I think in this case, because the site is unstable and there's a stockpile there that um, I certainly wouldn't allow any additional work other than that finished grade and stabilization. But I think it's really at your discretion. And if you guys are uncomfortable with it in any way, that's completely your discretion to, to express so, that yeah i mean i i can, I can see uh the, the need for it and the fact that it's uh it's just one last step etc mm -hmm. i'm just curious to see how we you know how we would allow it what uh what you know what kind of i don't know what authority we would have to to allow it when they've got a, an expired uh you know, their permits expired. Yeah. So they did submit a, you know, a, um, a formal written request to do this. Um, so I think we, we have to respond one way or another. I do agree with you, Andre, that it's, it's a gray area. Um, and I've never run into this before where something like this has happened. Um, so if you're uncomfortable with it from a regulatory standpoint, um, I completely understand. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just trying to explore for now. Yeah, of course. Understood. Alexandre, Bruce? So, Aaron, let's imagine the things that can go wrong here. Um, 48 hours is a short amount of time. We've had a lot of intense weather events that have popped up pretty quickly. There has to be probably some language in this that says, well, if it you know, it's pouring down rain and we have to wait another 48 hours that we don't have to come back to the commission to ask to do that. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. but the other thing is that given those difficulties of getting the the lawn, I guess, is what we're talking about to really take, can we leave the protective um, boundary in place until spring? Why does it, or did you mean that the final inspection might actually happen in the spring? Well, the reason that this concerns me is I've been monitoring this site for three years now. It's a very gravelly and very sandy site, and it's also on a slope. And so what ends up happening is material from this site, which is primarily open and unvegetated, is constantly being washed down to the toe of the slope at the erosion control boundary. And it requires almost continual maintenance and also like I've been on the owner's case to fix the fix the the sagging siltation barrier on a regular basis and so my concern is that um leaving it for another season open just allows additional um uh suspended solids to move toward the wetland area no, i don't um, mean that i meant oh. leave the protective barrier in place you're talking oh, yeah. about the silt fence yeah. the silt fence yeah. at the bottom yeah. of the slope yeah absolutely yeah i mean i think you could you could absolutely leave the silt fence in place after that, that's all done. i meant yeah and um when i mentioned the 48 hour work window i didn't mean to imply that the commission would say you can only do it on this day and that day i meant more from when they initiate the start of work. And I do think that um, making sure that we outline the weather conditions would be really important. Um, 
basically, you know, noting if you if you undertake this process, you need to complete it within 48 hours and finish it. Um, the other thing that occurs to me, and this is just an idea, is to issue them an enforcement order. Because under an enforcement order, you can require certain work to be completed. And it's basically an order telling them that they have to do it. And so um, that is a option. Obviously, the applicant or the owner probably wouldn't like getting an enforcement order very much just because the implication is that they've committed a violation. But if you look at the site right now, it is essentially a violation because it's an open, unstabilized site that has no active permit. Um, so just an option to consider. Aaron, was th is this over an acre? Was this subject to the construction general permit? No, it's a single family home. Um, I want to say it's probably a quarter acre of disturbance, maybe um, okay. around the house. Um, somewhat piggybacking off of what Bruce was mentioning, are we within our uh, regulatory capacity to make them put a different type of sediment control at the bottom of that slope? Yes, and I actually already tried that. Um, when the permit was originally issued, um, they called for the silt fence and I, I asked them to put in another control and they said, well, this is what the permit says, so this is what we're doing. Um, certainly now that the permit is expired um, and that plan is no longer valid, we can ask for whatever we want. You know, it would be nice to see something um, that's biodegradable as opposed to a plastic silt fence especially if it's going, if we decide that we would like it to remain throughout the winter, uh, winter, you know, mm -hmm. until it's stabilized, we'll say. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think that's uh, a great idea. I would, I would prefer that that happen. A larger diameter sediment control, either a bio, biodegradable straw waddle or a biodegradable compost filter sock. And, uh, you know, do, do you have any idea how steep the slope is? Um, it's, it's not terribly steep at the front of the site. It's relatively flat, but they have almost like a walkout basement. So, um, you can imagine sort of the grade around the sides of the house. It drops down. I don't know the exact, um, uh, steepness of the slope. I would estimate probably a 12 inch diameter or an 18 inch diameter. Okay. And do they have you you mentioned erosion control and do they have an actual erosion control like an erosion control blanket or a temporary hydraulic mulch sprayed on it or were you referring to the silt fence when you mentioned that i was referring to the black filter fabric silt fence okay so you know another option here is if if uh for whatever reason, they can't get a contractor or somebody to come out and perform the hydro seeding. Now they're not, they're probably not going to be able to get anybody to do a temporary hydraulic mulch. But uh, if, if for whatever reason they miss the, the seeding window, uh, they can do a hydraulic mulch and that should have a, a long enough lifespan to get them through the winter and into the uh, next growing season in the spring. But I'm, my experience is that October 15th um, is roughly when you want to make sure you get all of your seed down by. Um, I'm going to say with the way uh, the climate has been going, probably going to have the, the growing season probably going to be extended a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, they still have a good month. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Alex? Uh, Aaron, do you have any pictures? You know, um, let me let me just take a quick look and in my what's that? While you're looking, it's do I understand correctly that they have been three years? It, it's over three years since their permit was issued, and yeah, it's expired now. Right. So there was something else going on that that resulted in this. Um, pile of dirt and so they haven't been recalcitrant for three years they have had a, con what, a construction project 
and or landscaping or something of that sort. So what I can tell you, um, I'm just going to take a break from looking for the pictures for just one second. This is what I can tell you. These folks purchased the property right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think that they were extreme casualties of the construction um, downfall that occurred during the pandemic, which was the materials um, weren't available and that the cost of everything went up um, sky high and they were building all through the pandemic with those conditions. And my observation is that it did present a significant financial hardship to them. And as a result of that, they sort of stopped when they um, economically had to <laughs> and um, that they were kind of waiting to to try to um, recover financially before they completed the work. Um, and so I think that that did play into um, their situation. So um, I understand that material is moving into the wetland, but are any functions and values of that wetland being seriously impaired? Um, material is not moving into the wetland. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. The, they are in the buffer zone and the materials building up on the upland side of the silt fence. Um, but I have had to inquire with them on a couple occasions to, on a couple of occasions to get out there and maintain it um, and I think a lot of that had to do with the fact it was a single family homeowner that was there that didn't necessarily know um, what they were supposed to be doing as far as maintenance is concerned and I'm having a hard time finding the photos I do have some photos from um wait hold on one second uh see this one might be it so along Bruce's question, do we have authority to issue an order? I think that was Andre, but yeah, so we have an N. We Andre. could you could use an NOI. They would may have to reapply for the permit, or Aaron is suggesting that we um, issue a formal letter in response to their formal letter. So this was these photos were actually I do have more current photos, but th these are the only photos I could get my hands on quickly just to give you a sense of what the site looks like. Um, you can see the large stockpile to the right, which is vegetated, um, and the driveway, this, you know, the driveway and also sort of this side of the site is open, um, and the back side of the site is open. Um, construction entrance. You can see this is what's happening into the fence in the back, and I, I apologize, these photos are not great. But you can see the material. Um, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I can see a lot of dirt up against. Yeah, that there's a a lot of dirt is you know regularly accumulates against this fence and, um, yeah, and you it's can, quite, it's, you know, that's yeah, all. I mean, that's from the pile. That's all been moved. Come again. All that dirt's been moved. All that dirt's been moved yes, by water. Yes, this was this was com this was cleaned up after I went out to do an inspection. They went out and cleaned the material off the fence. So this was this was over a year ago that this these photos were taken. But I required them. There was a breach in the fence, so I required them to go out there and clean up the material that had breached. Um, but this is what I'm saying. Like I, this is not a site that I would want to leave open any longer than we have to because of the conditions that I've observed previously during construction. Um, I want to say that this siltation barrier is around the 50 foot buffer. So there's quite a bit of dif difference or distance between the silt fence and where the wetland is located, which the wetland is pretty far into the tree line. But even so, um, I, I just don't want to leave the site open longer than we have to, if it's possible for and us it, to get that's, it stabilized. That's silt fence, so fence right along the driveway? The silt fence is behind the house. Um, so yeah, it's the and wetland, it, the wetlands it, behind the house. So they won't stockpile snow on it when they plow. No, no, the they won't be the yeah, the the silt fence okay. is not in the driveway area. So they've got time now to see that, that pile is already grassed. The pile is grassed. From what yeah. I saw. Yes, yep. Hmm. Well, when did the when did their permit expire? 
Their permit expired, I believe, August 25th or thereabouts. Oh, so recently. Very recently. Yep, the end of August. So I mean, no, go ahead. I would favor them issuing issuing an order telling them to get it done mm -hmm. or, or give us reason why they can't and must wait till spring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they want to you know, do it. They they want to do it. They're they have a a machine um ready to do it basically as soon as you guys approve. But I do think that it would be prudent to issue an enforcement order and and let them know we're not issuing this for to you because you've committed a violation. We're issuing it to you because your permit expired. The site's not stable, and we need you to stabilize it and give them conditions associated with that. I would favor that and just get it done. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Alex. Andre? Yeah, I, uh, I'm i in agreement with that. I think that gives us a uh, kind of more of a legal um, mechanism through which to not just request, but also authorize um, the uh, the work that uh, we want. The form of insisting. Not, what's that? <laughs> I said it's a form of insisting. It's, it's yes, it is. And uh, likewise, it's, uh, you know, uh, because otherwise I'm not quite sure legally or where we uh, have the authority to 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 uh, to permit that um, if we're not actually requesting that they uh, or insisting, like you're saying, uh, that we um, that they comply with uh, with the, or the conditions from before. So I, I agree with Alex. I don't know about the rest of you guys. Okay. Um, so Alex, your hand is still up. I, I'm assuming it's from your previous comment. Okay. So we have Alex and Andre um, who are in favor of not a formal letter, but in, an order or um, notice of enforcement so that we can specify the conditions and make sure this gets moved along in a timely fashion. Um, I'm also in favor of that. So Bruce and Jason. Yes. Okay. Jason. Good. Yep, okay. I'm in favor of that as well. All right, great. So um, do we need you to draft up orders of conditions on this? Like, how do we move forward with the notice of enforcement? Yeah, so this is what my recommendation would be. I'm going to I'm gonna read to you what the motion should be. And then if somebody just wants to say so moved, and then I'll proceed tomorrow with issuing the enforcement order. And then um, I'll communicate with the applicant and let them know we're not... Um, you know, we're not trying to come down on you, but we're, we need some sort of legal avenue to allow you to do this. And this is the mm -hmm. avenue that we're going to use. Um, so just to let right. them know that they can proceed and what our conditions are. So um, my recommendation is that the commission issue um, an enforcement order to the owner of 200 Leverett Road. And that in that enforcement order, it specify that um, they are required to stabilize the to complete the final stabilization that was associated with the original order of conditions. Um, conditional on that final stabilization is that they, number one, have a um, an erosion control inspection to make sure that their erosion controls are functioning prior to the start of work, um, that they uh, would remove the existing erosion controls and install some sort of a biodegradable form of erosion um, controls, as suggested by Jason, uh, like a straw waddle, um, that they notify us of when the work is going to start and that they complete the work within a 48 hour period and that in starting the work that they should check the weather forecast to make sure that they're not going to be starting the work in the middle of a, um, a rainy period of time that it should be done when when it's dry um, that the final stabilization of or the final spreading of um, uh, topsoil should be completed and then it should be seeded and mulched with um, either either a hydro seed, a uh, hydraulic mulch such as what Jason suggested, or that they um, seed it and put down a straw mulch over the top. Thanks, Aaron. Jason, do you want to add something? Yeah, I have two things. Um, first, Aaron, my recommendation to put a biodegradable sediment control at the toe of the slope is only if they are not going to stabilize it now okay, and are going to do something temporary until the springtime. 
Okay. And then um, as far as final stabilization, the, the hydraulic mulch that you mentioned, that would be that temporary stabilization. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. we're looking for them to stabilize it in uh, regarding their original order of conditions, um, we want it stabilized. Okay. And hydraulic mulch is for temporary stabilization. So we don't want to mention that as okay. an avenue for them right now. Got it. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to start again then in that case to make sure that Sorry. this is clear. No, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you clarified um, it because. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Alex, did you want to add anything while Aaron's editing? Yeah. Before she starts drafting, uh, might we put in a, a time period by which to complete stabilization? To make sure that there is time for grass to grow before um, the growing season is over. Yes, so point. Work to be completed by name a date, end of September. Yeah, I was going to say the work must be completed by October first. Um, I think that gives them plenty of time. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Okay. okay, so do you want me to roll through this again, just to make Please it easy do. for a motion? Okay, yes. so a motion to issue um, an enforcement order to the owner of 200 Leverett Road. Uh, the conditions would include um, that the uh, that there's a inspection of the erosion controls prior to any earth moving activities. Uh, that um, once the um, the spreading of topsoil seeding and mulching and or hydro seeding is complete um, that they notify me for a final inspection um, that the wet that the work must be completed uh, within a 48 hour period from start to finish and that they must check the uh, weather conditions to ensure that they're doing it during a period of dry weather and I think lastly that they uh, complete the work by October 1st. Thanks. So moved. I'll second. Okay, we have Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. Excellent. Thanks okay. for working through that one, everybody. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Holy Oak Trail. Thank Again. you for digging up the pictures too. That helps. Yeah, definitely. It gives a good uh, indication of what's going on. Okay, so Holy Oak Grange Trail Work. Um, and just just so that you guys know, um, when I have time to do this, I will. Which is, um, I added in our our folder, and I'll show you where this is so that. It's clear. I added in our folder a, a site visit various inspections folder. And these are, you know, when I have time to do this, I do try to do this where I plug in just a, a sampling of you, for you of the projects that I've been working on since our last meeting. Um, in this case, the Holyoke Range trail work was completed. And so I just wanted to give you guys a quick, oh, why it does this to me doesn't let me do it. Okay, I'm going to pull up the project folder. Um, so the Holyoke Range trail work was completed, um, and I went out to do a final inspection so that they could remove their controls. And um, I wanted to show you the pictures because the work actually turned out really nice. Um, but there was also one issue that I wanted to make you aware of. Um, so this is the, I, a couple of folks on this call were actually out on the site walk. So you can see this is the finished area of the resurfaced trail and where they've narrowed the trail, which is really nice because there's BBW on both sides. Um, this is an example of a water bar. I did ask them to install a couple check dams in this water bar because I could see that um, gravel was already being carried down into the gravel bar and this is a wetland right here. So I asked them to put a couple um, uh, check dams of stone into that water bar to uh, slow down the water and hopefully reduce some of the turbidity that's flowing towards that wetland. This is another shot from the other side of the trail. Um, this is the Pynchon um, uh, bog bridge that was installed on one of the crossings. 
Uh, this is another. And then this is the little footbridge that goes over the um, the stream. I did recommend that they do some stabilization. Um, I asked them to install some um, woody vegetation along here. And I'll, I, I asked them to do this on all of them, basically to put like a log across here and a log across here on both sides, and then to seed these areas and mulch them. Um, so that it'll reduce, um, you know, somebody riding down on their mountain bike and driving through and also hopefully start to establish some vegetation um, in these locations. And um, I did ask them to do that basically on all of the um, bridges, just because I think it's sometimes tempting for mountain bikes to go around these structures. And I think the idea is to steer them onto it. Um, but the the one piece that I wanted to just share with you that I um, recommended, oh, that was a Chris picture actually kind of a cool picture of Chris Valente there walking. Um, anyway, there was one section of the trail that had a pretty bad um, washout, and I recommended that they put some um, uh, small riprap sized stone in there, basically just to prevent this from continually washing out. There was a uh, discharge point at the bottom of this scour line and it basically was coming out right near a wetland area so I ba basically just asked them to stabilize that um, and hopefully you're okay that I asked them to do that but it was it's all the rain that we've had caused this pretty significant washout and this has been happening on a lot of trails and dirt roads up in the hills um, with the rain that we've had this year. So I just wanted to share. And we'll be continuing. And we'll be continuing to have. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thanks, Aaron. That looks um, good. Great. Um, okay, 64 Mill Street. Hey, before you go on, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. You... <laughs> I have a question too. Go ahead, Bruce. Um, and I am aware that there is a group called the Friends of the Holyoke Range. Have they some engagement in all this or um, so this project ha was done by AmeriCorps and um, they had a, um, the, from what I understand, the Kestrel Land Trust um, got this AmeriCorps grant and they partnered with the um, AMC Appalachian Mountain Club to do it. Um, and so I believe in the example of this case, they, they had AmeriCorps members who did the work and the, yeah. tra the, grant was funded separately but um i have heard of the group that you're talking about and i've heard that historically they did quite a bit of um trail projects but um i haven't seen any since i've been here thank you thanks bruce um just going back to that shot of the bridge where you had requested uh woody debris and some plants yeah that looks concerning to me that looks like fun on a mountain bike <laughs> not no not on the bridge i'm just worried about what plants would take there cuz it just looks like a pretty leafy bare understory and i'm wondering if beefing up the the logs might be a better like you know quick course of action um you mean to put some more woody debris in that location I mean, not even just woody debris, like not pulling a log from somewhere and crossing it because somebody could just move that because um, I've I've had that experience with mountain bike trails. But but like a, a real like cut log, like a pressure treated something, something that says don't go this way, because that just looks like bare dirt. And it, you know, it's just a sort of a bare understory and a deciduous overstory. And it doesn't look like much takes to that ground. Mm -hmm. So yeah, upstream more of a and, people management thing than yeah. a vegetation management thing. Yeah, I can definitely mention that to to Kestrel. Um, there was a pretty um, nice established understory upstream and downstream of this location. So I do think that, but again, there is a lot of compaction in that location. So I'll I'll mention that to them and see if there's something yeah. that they can. Um, it looks very compact and like like washy and yeah anyway just in my experience that might get a lot of trampling or tires okay so, that's so all I'm, yeah i'm pretty ahead. familiar with that one spot there that crossing oh. yeah um and i would i've been racing mountain bikes since 93 i would never try to go over that really okay well that's good yeah context. i mean i uh yeah i mean you 
you really have to, uh, if you're going to get through there, you really have to go slow, uh, slow down quite a bit. The bridge is a lot better, but those other spots that you're, the other bridges that you're talking about are, I would be concerned about. Mm-hmm. You would be concerned about them. Yeah. Yeah, I would, because people may want to want, ride around it. Mm-hmm. Okay. But the one, the, the one where the stream is, is, is not. Too not gnarly. So- Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the insight, Andre. Yeah. <laughs> there you have it. Okay. Okay. Um, so 64 Mill Street, um, some folks who are currently on the board may remember this. It was a, um, they drilled a geothermal well on the site and um, bear with me while I get there because it's in a different folder. Um, and the situation is that they had the well drilled and they previously had a paved driveway. They had the well drilled. And when the well drilling was completed, um, now it's caused basically an erosion issue. Um, and so they are asking if they can um, address the erosion by uh, repaving the driveway to um, address the problem. So you can see in this case, uh, can you see this photo? It's a, have I shared it? Not no, I haven't shared it yet. Hold on. Okay, let me get there. Bear with me. Um, so here's basically a um, a photo of what's happened. So the the well drilling took place. Um, uh, sorry, my the well drilling was in this location, and it destabilize the surface of the driveway. And so now they're getting a lot of material that's washing across the driveway. Um, and that's what they're, why they're looking to do the um, the repair to the driveway. Um, and here's another photo of the material washing down the driveway. Another photo of the material washing. Sorry, so, you said it, it was paved. And they unpaved it. Um, so the wetland is. Um, huh, this is a good question. So this is off of Mill Street, which is. Um, I'm looking down the driveway right now. Um, in this photo, and the Mill River is the the dam. The dam from Puffer's Pond is here, and the the Mill River is down here. So they're actually in riverfront area with this. Um, and that's that's what makes this project jurisdictional. Um, so the, this material is not actually washing down into a wetland. It's washing into an upland area, but um, he, he wants to stabilize it and just, um, you know, fix the driveway. Um, Michelle's question was, is it, it, it was previously paved. Um, and when the work was done to, uh, to do the geothermal well, they tried to stabilize it with a stone, but it, it didn't, um, they damaged the paving so much with the drilling that um, it didn't really do the job to stabilize the surface. So they're realizing now they need to repave it. So this was a um, request for determination that permitted this work and repaving wasn't part of the determination. Um, but he he has a contract lined up to have it repaved in mid uh, mid October. And so he's, he's, he basically asked me if he could do the repaving. I didn't feel comfortable authorizing it without speaking to you first, um, speaking to the board first. Sorry. Uh, I think Alex asked that they're going to pave with the well. The, um, they would. They're. My understanding is that they're paving over the location where the well was drilled. Yes. Because the the well is tied into their heating system um, underground, and so I don't think it really matters if they pave over it. Oh. And it's a um, geothermal well, if I didn't mention that, and not a drinking water well, but a geothermal well for heating their house. Any other comments or questions? Does anybody know why repaving was not part of the original? Um, I think... I think that his intention was to try to stabilize it with stone in the work area, but um, he, with all the rain that we've been having, the stone wasn't really adequate to 
um, stabilize the location. Uh, he is on a he is on a slope here. The driveway is pretty sloped. It's kind of difficult to see in these photos, but it's a it's a pretty steep incline coming up the hill. And I think he just underestimated um, that it wasn't going to be sufficient to stabilize after the work was completed. Sounds reasonable to me. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. Does anybody object? Doesn't sound like it. Do we need a motion okay. to approve this? I don't. I don't think so. I'm going to handle it informally as long as everybody's okay and it's on the record that you guys are comfortable. Okay. Um, I just want to comment that the geothermal wells are sort of new, I think, for this commission. And we're kind of discovering now what um, is involved with, you know, the drilling aspect and then the aftermath. So this is unique in that it's on a slope, but I'm just kind of pointing out that here are some literal downstream <laughs> effects of how, you know, this is happening because it is a um, gaining traction as a so a new energy source, which is great. It's just that there is, you know, impacts. So just, just keeping that in mind for the next time it comes up. Absolutely. And I would echo, um, you know, there was, when we originally had the discussion about geothermal wells, there was a lot of claims that geothermal wells were considered to be a minor activity. And um, the previous commission prior to us having quite a bit of rollover in our, um, in our uh, membership, felt that it was essential that they have a permit. And my observation from um, viewing a couple of geothermal well drilling sites is that it is extremely important for them to have a permit from the Conservation Commission to do the work because the dewatering alone that's associated with the drilling of these wells is significant. You get a lot of dirty water that's kind of very turbid, dirty water, a lot of spoils, a lot of um, stone gravelly, sandy material that comes out of the drill um and so it's it's been important that these sites had permits and controls in place because otherwise it would have been a disaster thanks for the context darren mm -hmm. okay so um I think, do we have one more thing on our list? We have two more things on our list. Okay. And these were kind of last minute things that were added in. Um, one is that the chair of the Shootsbury Conservation Commission has shared with us um, some draft regulations that the Shootsbury Conservation Commission is in the process of reviewing. Um, they have a hearing, um, I believe next week, it's the 18th. Um, and, you know, the Shootsbury has had a wetlands bylaw for quite a while. They're only now the um, Conservation Commission has started to develop these regulations and they've been having a really difficult time. Um, there's been a lot of resistance in town to them. And so they're sort of seeking support from neighboring conservation commissions. Um, I am a Shootsbury resident, so I will give that as a full disclosure here. Um, uh, and one other just important point of information is that part of the Amherst town water supply is located in Shootsbury. So these, the surface and water uh, surface and groundwater protection that um, these regulations provide are extremely important to protect Amherst's drinking water. And um, uh, I've been disheartened to see the lack of support for passing them um, among other boards and committees in the town of Shootsbury and just feel that it's important that they feel supported. And so just bringing this to you to consider um, if it's something that you guys wanted to express support for, or if you don't, that's also okay. But um, if you felt that it was important to share with you and the chair of the Conservation Commission um, reached out to us officially. So, thanks, Erin. Um, so, as per our conversation earlier, they do not have staff. Is that correct, Erin? It's just the correct. it's just the commissioners. Okay, so they don't have an Erin helping them out, which is you know much much more difficult to do these things. Andre, uh, yes. So, who's who's the chair that you're mentioning? Miriam Defont. And uh, 
the the type of support that we would uh, provide uh, would 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 we be taking a look at the draft uh, for, before supporting it, or are we talking about a generalized uh, look? We need everybody needs uh, you know the recommendation that uh, or maybe something that to talk among among us. Um, are we looking to uh, just support in general the need for bylaws? Um, I think it could be any one of the things that you've referenced. If you want to read and give specific, you know, endorsement, if you want to just give general support for development of the regs, um, if you wanted to attend the hearing that's coming up um, on Monday, um, that's also an option. I believe it's Monday at 8 p.m. Um, uh, I think any any support that you're that the conservation commission is comfortable with. Yeah, are you suggesting? Well, sorry, Bruce, I saw you that we no, do no, this no. independently. Yeah, or have some kind of coordinated statement from the Amherst Conservation Commission. I mean, that's kind of what I um, was going to suggest, but uh, or what I had in mind, I guess, was a, a like a a letter of support. But it's, it's completely up to you guys. Okay, Bruce. Well, one concern that I have, despite the fact that some of our water comes from Tootsbury, um, if we do anything more than a general support letter that says, yeah, it's a great thing that you have a, uh, a bylaw, it may just uh, not have the effect that we would like because people may, in Tootsbury, may get upset that Amherst is trying to push them around. And... I can imagine if I lived in a different town and a, a, the town next door starts meddling in my affairs, I'm not going to like it. Now, maybe that's an extreme outcome, but it's a possible one. And so I, my view is that we should be as supportive as possible uh, is, um, without digging too deep into the, the fine grain detail of what they're proposing. Thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to make any kind of specific statement without, you know, very specifically looking at what their bylaw update is. Um, and I'm not sure that we have the capacity to do that. But having just updated our own bylaws, I think what Andre mentioned, sort of being generally supportive of having town bylaws in the support of what the town's, you know, needs and priorities are and the protection of water supply, that's, that's something that's obvious that we can support the town and doing and keeping up to date on. Like, for example, Amherst really needed to update our bylaws because many of the things were almost antiquated, you know, like there are some uh, principles that we can certainly get behind without being specific about what exactly they're changing. And so that would just be where I am on having any kind of coordinated or specific effort. And just for the record, it's not a revision. This is it's a, not. This is not a revision. They they've okay. had a bylaw in place for I believe a couple decades now, but re, uh, regulations were never promulgated. So this is their. They are. Um, these are new. These are. Um, they're looking to establish them in the town. As opposed to revise them, which is the position that we were in. Establish regulations. Yep. That the bylaw gave them. The authority. authority to establish in the first place and they just never did it correct and i think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's you know a new board member is similar to this situation it's been a lot a lot of years where um there was a variety of people serving in the role and now there's fairly new membership and people are inspired to to get the local regulations established and uh, so the effort, they've been working on them for like two years and now um, kind of in the final stages of passing them or hopefully passing them. Alex? Yeah, Aaron, do you plan on going to the meeting on Monday? Yes, I am. As a as a Shootsbury resident, that's correct. Okay, and and a while ago you had a letter to the editor and the uh, 
Gazette, I believe, talking is... about how the selectmen were um, um, putting pressure on the Conservation Commission, political pressure. Right. Yeah. Well, so, so yeah. Um, will your showing up at the at the meeting have any ripple effects? At the um, Shootsbury meeting? Yes, it will. Or is that just a, yeah, let me think about it. Um, I regularly attend Shootsbury Conservation Commission meetings just as a resident. Okay. Um, so I okay. don't really think it's going to be like something out of the blue for me to go. Okay. So might that be enough? Well, or, you know, it's again. I'm, I'm. I got a second. I got a second part. But in terms of other people going on Monday, would your going suffice? I can't speak for the Conservation Commission as a resident of Shootsbury, so um, I wouldn't join the Shootsbury Conservation Commission meeting and say, I'm here as a resident, but I also work in Amherst and I'm carrying this message along. You know, I'd, I wouldn't really feel, feel comfortable doing that. Um, I feel like I kind of have to, if, if the messaging is going to come from uh, the town of Amherst Conservation Commission, then I'd rather that that kind of be decided on by you guys. But um, I, as a resident, will just attend on my own. Eric. I want to hear what Dave has to say. Yeah, Dave, did you have your hand up or was it okay? Lucia, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, um, this is a difficult one. Um, I I tend to to agree with what Bruce said earlier. Um, I think, yeah, it's it's pretty unusual for. Although I think we would all agree in principle, it's pretty unusual for committees and boards to comment across town lines. Um, I understand that part of our water supply is there. I, I, I think what, what I heard Bruce say was kind of a, a very general statement about the importance of wetlands and the importance of protecting natural resources and and uh, and uh, and resource areas could be a way to go, but I think getting more specific than that um, is could be problematic. And and I think Aaron, you know, it's hard for you, even though you might be speaking as a uh, Shrewsbury resident, and that's your prerogative. You know, it's hard to separate you. You have a very prominent role here in Amherst as our wetlands administrator. Often, you know, your name is referenced in the paper frequently and, and your your good work here. So um, again, you you are free to say and, and do whatever in Shootsbury, but it, it does kind of potentially blur some lines a little bit. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's a tough one. Um, yeah, I so, think Erin needs to talk as a private citizen if she attends, and she's just the conduit of information to us today. So I think this conversation is between us commissioners about if anything we would, you know, what kind of statement we would make. I do want to point out that one third of Amherst water supply is Thadkins Reservoir, and that is Shootsbury. Much of that land and the Shootsbury watershed is protected. Um, but it is of interest to Amherst, and there are general principles that we could make a statement on. But uh, yeah, I'll quest. Um, how about Andre? I'll just go in order. Everyone's got their hand up. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, so th that's just about what I was thinking about. And I think and I agree with what Bruce was saying before, but uh, really uh, making uh, certain statements about the uh, about how um, uh, regulations, uh, in other words, how um, uh, by town bylaw regulations enhance the uh, the the state's uh, regulations and how uh, and about the importance of protecting wetlands and, and so on, without making a recommendation 
to uh, without yeah, without saying, look, you need to pass this, uh, but is, in other words, say, look, in uh, we have found that these are important here in, in our town and in our town, this is what we've uh, done because it's uh, it's something that we found necessary and just leave it at that without, you know, I don't, I don't, I think I, I, I can completely see what uh, Bruce and Dave uh, are, are saying. And I think if we can stay away from controversy by um by just making these these statements without uh uh without without recommendations thanks andre alex uh would andre i mean would uh aaron be able to draft a simple one-page letter that might we might send to Stating yeah. the things that Andre just and, uh, talked about with that. I, th I think I'm inclined to keep Aaron's name off of the letter and, you know. She'd have to draft it and get it back to us for us to approve well, it. Well, or it could come weeks. from me or but, it could come from us. Um, I mean, I, don't, I think keeping Aaron out of it. there's something on the record. Yeah. I, I wouldn't mind starting one. For us, uh, you, Thanks, Andre. You would sign I, it. You would sign it. I was asking if she could draft it. Okay. Uh, well, it sounds like Andre might be draft. Okay. Andre sounds like he's offering to draft something. Yeah. We'll yes, come back uh, to that. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I just, I would recommend against, uh, I would recommend to keep Aaron out of it. Um, uh, let her let Aaron take care of uh, the town of Shootsbury uh, things directly, since she's a Shootsbury resident, and we as a commission draft our um, our words. And I think, and and although I don't have all the loads of time, I think I could probably put something quick together and send it to you guys. That's great. Thanks, Andre. Jason? Yeah, I was just wanted to come back to the fact that they're uh, clarifying exactly what it is that's doing. They're they're looking to adopt the regulations, correct? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, as far as a letter or something like that, I don't think that we need to offer any kind of support or, or recommendation even. We can just state that uh, the Amherst Conservation Commission you know, applauds the uh, efforts of the Shootsbury Conservation Commission to adopt regulations for uh, the increase in wetland protection. Uh, you know, we recognize, uh, we applaud that they recognize the uh, importance of protecting these natural resources. Something along those lines where we're not recommending that they do anything. We're not uh, trying to offer any kind of help. We're just simply stating that we understand that they're doing this and that uh, we applaud them for such actions. Thanks, Jason. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm no. just, uh, I'm assuming that if they've spent the last two years putting these regulations together, that they're probably going to adopt them. Go ahead, Bruce. The only thing, Andre, the only th other thing I was going to add is I would leave out any reference to the fact that Amherst has a big water supply in their town. Because I think for some people, that is a sore spot. And I would just stay silent about it. The people who know that it's there know it, and the people who don't, it probably doesn't matter. Eh, I'm not sure I yeah. agree with pretending that doesn't exist. <laughs> I mean, it's significant. And Amherst has spent a significant amount of conservation effort in that watershed. So I don't know. Maybe we don't have to discuss it in the letter, but I don't necessarily agree with the standpoint of. No, I simply meant that in the letter, we don't need to point it out. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think that, you know, the line that Jason and Andre are on is, is you know, supportive in principle and, you know, quite obvious for the benefits of water supply protection is for 
Fair enough. Yeah. Can I can I just uh, follow along with that, Alex? I'm sorry uh, to interject. Um, yeah, I see where you I see where you're coming from, Bruce. And what that and essentially, if we were to say, look, we get a bunch of our uh, we get this amount of uh, our water from the Atkins uh, Reservoir, that's Shrewsbury uh, uh, land and so on. Is kind of uh, us. Kind of uh, saying that. Uh, uh, saying that we have a that this is the horse we have in the in the race so to speak and it's i don't think it's i i do agree with you that it's not entirely necessary um, i like michelle's um uh, phrasing which was it just that it, the regulations are important for protecting uh drinking water sources of all yeah. kinds mm -hmm. yeah including private wells. Alex, is your hand up for a new comment? Yeah. It seems to me our choices are do nothing, show up in person, write a letter, or some combination of show up and write a letter. Andre has offered to write. I think we're done. The next thing okay. is to see what he writes. All right. Is is everybody in favor of writing a letter? Let's just do a show of hands, like because you know, I'm fine with that. Dave, did you want to talk? Or are you raising your hands? I don't want to interrupt your vote here, but I it does get a little complicated because um my recommendation would be if you vote to write a letter, vote to authorize Andre to write the letter and send the letter in the simplest form that you've discussed. You all can't share a letter, edit a letter on email, and then send it. That's a violation of the open meeting law. So, but you could authorize Andre or Michelle to send a simple letter to the uh, Shoots Break On Com. So that was my just my cautionary note here is you can't go out of session, share any share a, a letter you're drafting because that is really deliberating on an action of the commission. So just cautionary note there. Yeah, thanks for keep us, keeping us in check with that one, Dave. Well, especially since Andre is the vice chair, that that makes sense. Hmm. You know, I okay. could bring it. it, it yeah, okay. Well, if we want to keep Aaron out of it, Andre can't send it to Aaron to send it to the rest of us to look at at the next meeting. Is that correct, Dave? You could you could do it. When, when is the when is the shoots break on come discussing this or voting? Uh, on it? The hearing is on Monday. Monday. You know, I, I again I go back to what Jason said a few moments ago. If the shoots break on come has spent the last two years working this this draft, you know, it, it seems likely that they would they would vote to move it forward. I don't know that. I don't have a crystal ball, but if you're trying to get them something that is general, that is broad, that is shows, you know, th that expresses your support for the protection of natural resources, a very simple, a couple of lines that Andre could draft, I think would suffice. And that would get it there expediently, avoid an open meeting law violation, and not have to wait two weeks from now when their vote will have already passed if that's your intention of getting them something before their vote. So that's my my recommendation. Well, Michelle, if I could, let me come at this again. Uh, first, with a question to Aaron about immediacy. What's, what's the need in Shootsbury? What's the need for support? Is this, um, and what's the risk if we do nothing? Because it is an alternative. That's um, two questions. Yeah. What's the need? Is there it, is there a movement in town for them not to adopt it? Yes, there is. Um, I don't really want to go into too much detail on it, but there, exactly as you said, there there are um folks that are opposed to it, and that's um been pretty strong efforts to oppose it um 
And I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question, Alex? What's the risk if we do nothing? Um, well, if the Shutesbury Conservation Commission doesn't feel empowered to approve it, then it doesn't get approved. Um, and so I think that Miriam sending the email, which my understanding is she sent to all surrounding towns um, requesting their support. Uh, Correct. Would uh, give them something to sort of make them feel a little more empowered to move forward um, and or just confident to make a decision against uh, difficult odds. Do we need a motion in order for something to happen? I think it's at your discretion um, whether you want to make a motion or if you just want to collectively decide to appoint someone to be the um, messenger of the uh, intentions you want to send. Before I do that, Dave, is your hand just remaining up or do you have something else to add? I'm guessing it's just left over. Okay. So, so um, I'd like to make a vote. I'd like to make a motion then if I could. Go for it, Alex. I make a motion or I move that Andre draft a simple general one page letter and submit it to Shootsbury as the uh, vice chair of the Conservation Commission. Maybe specify that this will be for general principles about the values of bylaws for protecting water supply and wetland. Yeah, and that's what I kind of what I meant by general. But you said it better. All right, thanks, Alex. I second it. All right, Alex on the first, Bruce on the second, Andre. I guess it's an I. <laughs> <laughs> Jason. I. Bruce. I. Alex. I. And I'm an I. And thank you, Andre, for volunteering to do that. You're welcome. So uh, I'll just write something up um, fairly fairly brief and straightforward about uh, the, uh, yeah, about um, understanding what they're doing and uh, uh, that, that what applauding uh, their efforts uh, to protect uh, wetlands and, um, and then essentially just give an example, uh, throw as an example that uh, we've recent, that we have our own, uh, bylaw regulations that we uh that we updated last year yeah and, and if you account. if you're looking for some um language some easy language maybe visit our bylaws and the preambles and in the introduction you know just give some language about the importance of what they do so that might be just an, an easy way to yeah, absolutely some, yeah. yeah great no need to uh invent reinvent the importance yeah. of wetland <laughs> protection yeah. okay great thanks again um we do have two more items so one's um appointing a cpa a liaison and which i promised sam we do and discussing changes to the deadlines for plan revisions which i think the second one might be easy to consider if we want to do that real quick i assume everybody saw the item on the agenda, but um, Aaron or Bruce, I'm, do you want to present some rationale? Um, so previously, we've had a deadline of um, Friday at noon for submission of revised materials for um, for hearings. And Bruce and I were talking offline, and I hope you don't mind me bringing this up, Bruce. No, but this I would do it if you didn't. <laughs> uh, Bruce made the suggestion that we require basically that materials be submitted by close of business the Wednesday prior to the meeting in order to give the commission and staff additional time to review and respond to materials because it really doesn't give us much time um, to receive them Friday at noon when we have a, uh, a Wednesday meeting. 
I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. It always feels like it's coming in right at the line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so any anyone have any objections to that? Okay, do we need to move? Sorry, Alex, go ahead. No, I just muttered. Okay. <laughs> All right, Bruce, go ahead. There was a corollary to that also, which had to do with the day of the site visits. So uh, the, the other thing that's problematic for staff, and given that there's a lot of new people, it may be problematic for some of us, is what day of the week and what half day of the week are site visits typically held. Um, it makes it very difficult for Aaron to spend the morning of Wednesday dealing with site visits and then rush back to the office and do all the whatever extra there needs to be before the meeting. It's a very long day. Uh, and I think some of us have expressed concern that, well, I can't really get to the site business because I I'm working at that time, whatever the you know, Wednesday morning is not good. So uh, we need a solution to that, too. One at a time. One at a time. Is that what you said, Alex? Yes. Okay, well, let's start with the first one. Do we need a motion to change this or is this any kind of amendment to our regulations or is this just a standard? Okay, It's it's not regulatory, but I would recommend that we make a motion just so that it's on the record that this was official sort of policy that was set by the Conservation Commission. And it needs to say beginning when, because people out there in the world are imagining that it's at a certain, you know, there needs to be a, transitional period right uh, november okay give them 30 days um so we have a meeting on the 27th where there's a couple open hearings that are going to be continued to um and so it might be um prudent to say uh that this would be starting as of October 1st. And then that way we could warn the applicants who aren't present tonight at the next meeting that this is a, a new policy. Yeah. Okay. So, that works for me. So how about... Uh, I, I would just say, I think that we ought to kick it out to November 1st. October 1st is, I mean, you're, you're looking at less right than... Right around the corner. Uh, it's the 13th today. So yeah, uh, in the... And the you know just to be fair to everybody, I would say November first. And that that actually is a Wednesday, so that means that that would be the on that day is the deadline for the meeting of the eighth. Okay. So how about I say I move? Uh, let me know if I'm getting ahead of us. I move to. Uh, require that beginning November 1st, applicants for uh, for NOIs, no? Or for any permit. Applicants for permits um, have the, all of their, uh, all of their uh, documentation uh, submitted by Wednesday uh, at noon. Is that noon? Um, Wednesday close of business. The Wednesday, Wednesday close of business COB. prior to the scheduled meeting. Yeah. Prior to the scheduled meeting. Want me to try it again? I I got it. Um, what about updates? Is it is it all materials? Do we have a separate? Um, materials or revisions? Just materials. Uh, okay. Yeah. So everything. Okay. Great. All right, we had the motion. Anybody? I second it. Andre on the motion. Bruce on the second. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Great. Um, all right, do we want to handle the site visit hopefully fairly quickly? Can um, I just make a recommendation that I send out a doodle poll on that? Yeah. I like to see where people are at because yeah. who knows what works for who. Yeah. Yeah. 
<clears throat> I'll send a doodle poll with like it'll be I'll I'll set it up for one week, but it will be sort of your general availability in a given week. So you can just check it off. So it won't be specific to that week. It'll just be generally during that week when are you available. So you can check it off and give a the general sense and the expectation won't be that if you check it off you're going to be there at every single site visit at that time but if it's generally a time you're available you'll you'll try to be there if you can kind of thing sounds good thanks Aaron. Yeah. okay last thing up is a cpa liaison dave you gave a good spiel last year do you want to introduce the cpa to our new members or do you want me to do that yeah. Sure. So the Community Preservation Act uh, Committee um, uh, works very hard for, you know, about about five months of the year, four to five months of the year uh, to review, organize and review Community Preservation Act um, applications. Those applications come typically in um, about four categories, historic preservation, affordable housing, uh, conservation, open space, and recreation. Um, it's a really great committee. Uh, they actually, their first meeting is tomorrow night. Um, they, the, the period of most activity is usually between October and about February 15th. Their job is to review all the proposals that come in from town departments, as well as nonprofits and other organizations in the committee, or excuse me, in the community, uh, in those four categories. So these are, you know, typically really, you know, interesting and exciting projects like new playgrounds, new walkways, trails, open space preservation, um, historic preservation, um, you know, funding affordable housing uh, in our community, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, there is one liaison from the Conservation Commission who sits on that committee and both advocates for conservation projects, but also has a chance to review projects in all the other categories. So um, it's a really, a really cool committee and we need a representative from the Conservation Commission. Thanks, Dave. So currently they are meeting, they will be meeting Thursdays, generally six to eight and sometimes goes a little longer. Um, in deliberation um every week it's every week because it's yeah it's not a full year it's and i think i mean a lot of the uh time spent other than the meeting is reviewing the applications which because um there some can be fairly lengthy and then we deliberate on and ask questions of the applicant so <laughs> reviewing those takes some time and all that said, I'm happy to do it again because I did enjoy it. And, you know, there's some benefit to doing continuity or two years. But if anybody would like to serve for this next year, I'm happy to pass the baton. So any other questions or interest? Or... Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I, I'm happy to do it again. And I think there's, you know, a lot learned the first year round. So, you know, if you guys want to think about it for next year, it'll, it'll come up again. Okay. Well, I'd be open to doing two things. One is being considered a year from now and being the alternate if Michelle couldn't do it, that to make sure that we had somebody there, if you think that it's really necessary to have somebody there every time. Oh, that's interesting, Bruce. I don't I can think ask I can Sam. commit to the next, you know, X number of Thursday nights right now, but I, I'd be willing to be supportive if an alternate system is acceptable. Okay. I can, I can. Did someone else say something? There's an echo. Okay. Um, yeah, I can ask if we can have sort of a a seat for the conservation commission that could be you or me, but it does take some sort of being present for the, the hearing or the, anyway, thank you, Bruce. I appreciate that. And can it just anybody come to the meeting? Oh yes. It's open to the public. So, so I'm, I'm willing to come tomorrow just to get the feel of it. Okay. Right? So um, I'm not sure I will, I can follow up with you about that. I'm not sure if tomorrow is the 
best meeting because we're talking about okay um, you can go ahead and do it i just it's sort of a coming back together and talking about some holdovers from last well year. i can wait a week and do it the next week just yeah. to get a sense of how it functions sure that, that's good. let's let's talk about that offline but and, i'm open to I, the idea anyway if i could just add i michelle i don't think they'll be meeting for the next couple of thursdays because proposals aren't even due until the end of september so they okay. might meet tomorrow, but then there'll be a break. And then in October, I think, I think they'll pick up. I, I like the idea of an alternate, alternate, but I, I will say that ultimately all the members vote. So you do have to hear all the proposals, read all the proposals. So at the end of the day, end of the process, there's a rating for each proposal in each of the categories, the four categories. So it is really important to kind of hear all of those. But, you know, if Michelle is willing to do it for one more year and have Bruce kind of shadow that work a little bit, you know, perhaps Bruce could pick it up next year. Um, I'm, and, I'm open I to that idea. I just don't want to commit to it. Yeah, I think you'd really enjoy it, Bruce. Wow, wow. We have between one and $1.5 million every year to spend on those four categories. So it's really exciting to to hear the different yeah. across the community. So, Okay, right. Bruce. Well, if you come next uh, tomorrow and it okay. uh, piques your interest, I can, okay. <laughs> I can talk about reappointing you if you want. Okay. And I can find the link on the website how to, how to attend the meeting. Yep. That kind of stuff. It's already there. I, I looked at it tonight. Okay. Yeah. All right. So should we have a motion to appoint Michelle then? So move. Second that. Okay. Um Bruce. Yeah. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex is on mute, just so you know. Alex, are you there? We can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute. Hi. Okay, Alex is an I, and I'm an I. I was on mute, hi. Yeah, thanks. All right, I think that's it. Yes, we got through a lot of business so that we can spend some time on. Yep, go ahead, Baron. There is one additional thing which came in um, actually uh, yesterday or today, which is that we received a forest cutting plan for the Poverty Mountain Farm, which is off of Shootsbury Road. Um, I'm very familiar with the uh, um, forest cutting plan because I've met at length with Kevin Weir, who's the owner of Poverty Mountain Farm, and I've also um, we we worked with to, uh, Tobias Carter, who's the um, person who prepared the plan. It's a long-term forest management plan. They also have a lot of um, conservation, um, early successional uh, habitat kind of management strategies going on there. Um, but if anybody has official comments that they want to make on the forest cutting plan, they should come prepared with those comments um, on the 27th because we only have 21 days to comment prior to it's 21 days to comment or and or you could send me individually your comments offline um, if you have recommendations or conditions that you'd like implemented on the permit. Um, I feel particularly comfortable with this one because I'm where do we, where do familiar we see? with it already. Where is the permit filed? Um, or the plan? Where do we see the plan? Um, it should be, let me just verify that I uploaded it for you guys. It should be in the correspondence folder. Uh, mm. Under new correspondence received, a uh, forest cutting plan, Poverty Mountain Farm LLC, which is in the new correspondence received after Friday, in the correspondence folder for uh, September thirteenth. And is the landowner Poverty Mountain LLC, or who is the landowner? Yeah, do we have course? Do we have? Hold on, uh, just, Kevin just... Kevin Weir is the um is the individual who I'm um in contact with uh who who owns the farm but it's I think it's under the LLC the ownership. Okay, thanks. Alex Is there 
land that we're responsible for involved? Um, we do have a conservation. Did I not come across? Yeah, we do have a conservation restriction on a portion of um the Poverty Mountain Farm. Is my understanding. The town of Amherst has a conservation restriction on a portion. And I know previously they had submitted a forest cutting plan um, and we met with them and reviewed it. Um, so it's, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't really have much more to add on it. Um, the, the, the town of Amherst just reviews it and make sure that there's nothing egregious going on that violates the CR. Um, but it, the CR does allow for um, long-term forest management to be conducted as part of the conservation restriction. Yeah, they, just a little background. This used to be Walter Banfield uh, uh, the, was the owner before that. Uh, and I think Kevin Weir is Walter's Walter, I think Walter passed away and his Kevin Weir is his uh, so, son-in-law. To review. And uh, this property uh, has a lot of um, uh, grassland habitat um, left open there for uh, uh, for woodcock and other uh, grassland birds, as well as a whole lot of um, uh, good uh, wood woodlands going up Poverty Mountain. Bruce? Um, if we're done with this so one. The land use committee is going to be looking at all the stuff. Yeah. It's hard to understand you, Alex, but you said something about the land use committee looking at forest cutting plans. I'm not I'm not sure that's going to happen in time for the the timeline for this, but do you want to try and say that again? We're just having trouble hearing you. Go ahead. Well, the land use committee is going to be Sorry, Alex, you keep cutting out. Is there a way for him to message us? I was just saying that oh, there you are. the land use committee will be looking at forestry as a topic. That's on town in lands. Land management policy document. And um, if we have a CR on there and we want to review the cutting plan, well, So I'm having, Alex is cutting in and out for me, but just relative to the. I think he is relating it to the CR that the town has. And if there's some nexus with the forest cutting plan and the CR as far as our authority. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't give us any authority over the land. I'll call um, Aaron tomorrow. Okay, thanks, Alex. That'd be great. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I just want to quickly for forest cutting plans, just to give everybody like a. I don't. I don't think. All right, we lost Alex. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, I Darren. I just want to say that so when a forest cutting plan is sent to us from the state, it's considered to be exempt under the Wetland Protection Act and under our local bylaw. So unless we have concerns that are specific, that there's like wetlands that are going to be altered or. We think that there's going to be some damage to the wetlands. Those are typically the comments that the state is looking for if there's some kind of condition that or change to the plan that we think is essential in order to protect the wetlands or the interests um, of the, the resource areas. Um, but we don't really have a tremendous amount of authority to sort of intervene and um, condition and or specifically with um, private property where we hold CRs, if there's if they're allowed to develop a forest cutting plan, it would be really a difficult position to be in for the town to come in and say like, oh, you know, we want you to do X, Y, and Z. Um, it's because it's private property. Um, so, I mean, I, I just wanted to give that as background because it's not like 
somebody's filing a permit with us. The permit is with the state. And I believe that uh, I'm not sure if it's 10 days or 21 days. I want to check that. Um, so I would encourage everybody to look at it sooner rather than later to let me know if you have any burning issues, but um, it's automatically approved. It's uh, if, if we don't comment with a, within a certain period of time. Thanks, Aaron, for the context. Bruce? Um, so Aaron and I uh, talked about the possibility of having a site visit, a walk around visit for Fort River Solar at the golf course. And she said someone, something is coming our way on that. And I just wondered if we know when it's gonna be. Yeah, it's gonna be on the 27th of September. So um, that's in when the, the hearing, well, um, there's a hearing of the Conservation Commission. That's when the notice of intent review will begin. And I'll be, okay. schedu I'll be scheduling a site visit between now and then. And I'll use the doodle poll to determine what the date will be okay. of the site visit. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, I'm just going to go back to the forest cutting plan. Can you file a CE with that cutting plan so we can just look at whether or not the CE has that language in it. Oh, you want me to send you this, the um, conservation easement? Yeah, I would yeah, like, I course. mean, if that's where our, our authority is for even reviewing it, then that's pretty well, essential. Well, no, no, no. Um, I'll send the C, I'll send the conservation restriction for you to look at. Absolutely. And yeah, but that is not the limit of the, the any forest cutting plan in the town of Amherst is going to come to the conservation commission. Okay. It's, I think we have, it's either 10 days or 21 days to comment on it. And if we don't comment on it within that period of time, it's automatically approved by the state. Um, the state doesn't necessarily have to incorporate our comments uh, unless they think it's relevant and essential for wetlands protection matters. But um, I know in the past we've tried to suggest um, time of year restrictions and so forth. Um, and I'm I'm still looking into that. Just so you know, I haven't um, dropped the ball on that. I'm still I'm still um, inquiring on federal and state level about time of year restrictions and what the state's obligations are relative to that. So I'll continue to try to get what I can and report back to you guys. Okay, thanks, Aaron. All right, anything else? Um, okay, we have public comment. Nothing else from commissioners. All right, Jenny, I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, so I see that you're muted. Yep, you're on. Okay, thanks, Michelle, and mm -hmm. good evening. Thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Jenny Callick. I live on Shootsbury Road, and I wanted to offer special appreciation tonight for the letter you're going to write to uh, Shootsbury. A lot of the residents in the neighboring towns are very uh, close to each other working on climate change, and we've gotten involved in of course, land use, water, uh, wetlands, and resilience, uh, looking at solar together. So there is a community of people who, uh, although we have separate towns, we have separate concoms, uh, we're all looking at the same uh, goals to protect and to preserve resources. So your letter will mean a lot to those individuals and means a lot to us in Amherst who, who are part of this community of neighbors. So just an appreciation and thank you for that and for everything you're all doing. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, always nice to hear nice things from the public. <laughs> Bruce. Can I thank Jenny for coming at the beginning of the meeting if and staying yes. through all this so, to thank us. Very, yeah. very kind of you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> thank you all. Okay. All right. Well, we made it through. Um, and with that, looking for a motion. Everybody's I make a motion that we adjourn. I second it. <laughs> Alex on the motion. Andre on the second. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. All right. Thanks everyone for hard work today. And Andre for your homework. And Bruce, 
I'll see you in the meeting tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I'm feel proud. Yeah. And Aaron, you're gonna